I'm at Stony Brook University on Long Island, uh, New York, and I'm sitting in Professor Don Eide's office. Uh, and Don, perhaps you would begin by introducing yourself and tell, uh, telling us a, a little bit about your department. Uh, yeah, the I'm Don Eide, and uh, I've been at this university for a very, very long time. Uh, the department is a fairly large philosophy department, quite diverse although strongest in so-called continental philosophy, uh, namely Husserl, Heidegger, uh, Derrida, etc. Uh, but in the last uh, now nearly 10 years, uh, I have been conducting what's known as the Technoscience Research Group. Uh, this is a group of graduate students from several departments, uh, visiting scholars, usually international, and uh, occasional faculty who either come in occasionally or sometimes uh, for a semester at a time. Uh, in this group, you know, we read in the areas of philosophy of science, philosophy of technology, and science studies. Only living authors, and we bring in living authors that we've read seriously uh, for over some period of time for a roast. Uh, we're now on our 11th roastee this spring, be Harry Collins, who is one of the founders of social constructionism. Uh, we've uh, roasted his colleague Trevor Pinch, uh, Donna Haraway, Evelyn Fox Keller, Sandra Harding, uh, virtually every philosopher of technology who has any importance whatsoever, uh, Andy Pickering. Uh, so we've had quite a progression of people coming through. Now, as a result of this, uh, we also have a number of younger people who have finished their PhDs who are now out in the field and who are practicing uh, what I call post-phenomenological analyses of uh, philosophy of technology, science studies uh, type phenomena. Uh, for example, uh, one of my recent graduates, Evan Selinger, now at Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, is doing an in-depth study of the transfer of mobile phones into Bangladesh and looking at the social and uh, phenomenological impact of uh, these uh, kind of uh, technologies. My own case, uh, for the last 10 years, I've been researching imaging technologies with uh, particular attention to science imaging. Uh, I've taken a number of disciplines and sort of looked at them historically and phenomenologically, one of which is astronomy, uh, also medical imaging, uh, also imaging in uh, physics and uh, uh, in archaeology and a number of disciplines. Now, the purpose, of course, is to try to discern what the patterns of imaging are uh, in relation to both its history and its uh, phenomenology. Uh, the book, which is two chapters short of being completed, uh, is tentatively titled Imaging Technologies Plato upside down. Uh, anybody who knows Plato, of course, will know that he thought imaging was one of the lowest things on the scale with contemplative uh, uh, awareness of the logos at the top of the scale. Uh, my contention is you cannot have contemporary science without its being embodied technologically, and the main mode of technological embodiment is through imaging. Uh, you know nothing whatsoever about black holes, the multiplicity of galaxies, uh, DNA, et cetera, without imaging technologies. So it's a look at what makes particularly contemporary science possible. But it also has spin-offs, and the spin-offs uh, have lots of implications from everything from media uh, to humanities and social science disciplines. So this is one of the research tracks uh, that I've been following for a decade, and hopefully within about a year I'll have the manuscript uh, ready and off to press. Okay, I know that you are also working on a project you tentatively call uh, Against the History of Philosophy. Uh, can you please uh, explain what that is about? Well, the next book after the Imaging Technologies is going to be called Against the History of Philosophy, colon, uh, Material Hermeneutics. Uh, my contention is, and a lot of this is learned from the decade of work in imaging and sciences, is that the social sciences and humanities have 
tended to be linguistically oriented. That is, they look at text, they uh, take a great deal of credence from verbal uh, performances, uh, etc. And the question is, aren't they missing a lot, particularly from the material world, uh, if they remained logocentric, as uh, the postmodernists uh, would call it? So I'm taking what I've learned from science imaging and raising the question, what would happen if the same degree of sophistication and depth were applied to humanities and social science disciplines? And so far I've worked out a number of examples to try to show how that uh, material history is important. Uh, one is Otzi the Iceman, the freeze-dried mummy that was found in the Italian Alps in 1991. Uh, if you ask the question, when did this guy die? Uh, the answer is May. And how do you know it's May? Well, the answer is that in his stomach contents, uh, there was found the distinct pollen of the hornbeam tree, which casts its pollen only during the month of May. Hence, he died in the month of May. Uh, how old is he? Well, he's 5,300 years old by the latest, best calibrated carbon dating processes, etc. And you go from there, analyzing all the rest of his stomach contents, looking at uh, the fingernail uh, tracings, which indicated he was ill three times in his last year, etc. And by the time you get through with this, you have a very, very rich and deep story about uh, what his travels were, where he went, what he ate, when he died, uh, what his contexts were, and of course with him were his uh, clothing and, and uh, various tools and artifacts so that you, you know a lot about this guy where there's no textual presence, no linguistic presence whatsoever. And that, it seems to me, enriches precisely the kinds of questions which are asked by humanists and social scientists. Philosophy becomes the hardest task because in some sense it is perhaps the most linguistically oriented of the humanities disciplines and simultaneously perhaps the most insensitive to technology and materiality. Uh, so what I'm going to be doing in the book including working out other examples is to look at how uh, philosophy, for example, is disseminated materially, uh, what kinds of tools it uses in the production of its uh, own kind of knowledge, etc., and uh, to try to show that logocentrism should be expanded uh, through imaging and technologies into other areas as well. Okay, turning to philosophy of technology in general, uh, what do you think are the emerging trends in the field and uh, what are the areas that uh, are very important today uh, relating to uh, the study of technology in general within the humanities and social sciences? Uh, philosophy of technology has been very slow to gel in a sense. Uh, in one sense, it's a very recent discipline because both in Europe and America, it's largely a 20th century phenomenon, a bit earlier in Europe than in North America. Uh, in North America, it really begins with mid-century on. Uh, and so it's, it's still a young discipline and somewhat unformulated. Second aspect is, of course, that anybody dealing with technology has to know that approaches to technology must be interdisciplinary. So we can't talk simply about philosophy. We have to talk about the sociology, the aesthetics, the ethics, et cetera, of technology. And so you have a kind of multi-dimensional approach which is necessary in studying technologies. Now, I do think there are emergent themes uh, that are coming out of the philosophy of technology. Last summer at Delft, uh, the meeting of the Society for Philosophy of Technology, which is the North American, oldest North American Philosophy of Technology Association, met. And uh, it was the biggest and I think the most successful of the conferences that I've attended in uh, that uh, group. Uh, People, of course, are always interested in the role of ethics. Uh, I have a particular perspective on that, which is slightly divergent from the mainstream. The mainstream, of course, is what could be called applied ethics. What do you do in terms of just distribution of technologies which are in place? And I think that's very, very important. It grew up first in medical contexts, but is now expanded to everything from business contexts to 
uh, other things. I happen to think that equally or perhaps even more important is the projective aspect, which I call being placed in the research and development phase. That is, as technologies develop, that is the time to begin to consider what are the consequences likely to be and what kinds of directions should be take, we be taking with the development of technologies per se. After they're in place, it's already too late, and by then you're picking up the pieces and so forth. So I think that is an important development. Then, of course, any development which clearly has implications for massive social transformation, et cetera, should be part of philosophy of technology. Uh, a big issue which will be with us for a long time is the so-called information society or information technology and the way in which this links and uh, develops in the w wider world, its role in globalization and all the rest. Uh, new technologies, for example, the nanotechnologies, uh, which, for which the implications are very unclear at this point. Uh, clearly, genetic technologies, all the biological technologies which are emerging. So any sort of new direction in technology should be examined by philosophers of technology. Uh, my own approach uh, is one in which I encourage the development of empirical or concrete studies. Uh, take a technology or some group of technologies and follow them through both with respect to prospects and contemporary situation of development uh, as well as where they've gone in the past. Okay, returning to uh, the being in the research and development phase, uh, you also talk about the designer fallacy. Uh, what, are, what is the limit of designing in uh, your opinion? Well, I think we're coming out of, thank God, uh, the remnants of the 18th and 19th century. Uh, this is a deistic concept, if you will, that there's some sort of designer god who uh, works upon some kind of plastic uh, formable material and then creates something which is of good design and go from there. I think this kind of analysis does not work uh, and it's unrealistic. So, uh, rather, uh, what I see is that all technologies uh, are multi-stable, uh, from the simplest ones to the most complex ones. And because of this, uh, first of all, there's a great deal of inability to make clear projections as to how a technology uh, will be used Uh, what its impact will be, etc. And one has to take this indeterminacy into account from the very, very beginning. Uh, secondly, I think the notion of some sort of uh, intentional designer being able to enact a will over material is, is much too simplistic and naive. Uh, today, for example, in almost any kind of world we're talking about, Uh, there's no such thing as an individual designer. There are designers, there are designer teams, there are behind them the, the funding sources and the corporations. And then there's the variety of materials and the variety of possibilities that goes with the materials and an even wider variety of users. So it's a very, very complex uh, notion. And uh, there again, my argument, in spite of all of the difficulty which this poses, is that it's important to do the reflective critical thinking at the research and design level to say what kinds of things could come out of this. I mean, when you think of the usual uh, wisdom about the Internet, the Internet was originally designed to be a kind of security device for the use of scientific researchers and the military establishment Uh, and obviously today's internet doesn't look like that at all. It has that element still there, uh, but it's now all over the place with everybody using it and questions of control. Well, for example, I'm going to China in a few weeks and a lot of discussion in the papers has to do with the Chinese attempt to uh, gag the internet, as it were, to keep it from, from being free. Uh, most people who are really good, hardcore internet users, and I find that to be the case with almost anybody under 20, knows how to get around that. 
there's no way that they will ultimately be successful in gagging the Internet. Uh, and so it's only a matter of ingenuity and ability to go around uh, the various stops and all of us who get worried about identity theft know that there are more ways to steal an identity than there are to skin a cat. Well, thank you very much, Don Adi, for sharing uh, your research and thoughts with us. You're welcome. I hope to be seeing you in Denmark.